Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to Searching for Dragons. I'm your hostess, Snappy, and I'm joined by my good friend, Graham. How's it going, Graham? Good. How are you? Amazing. And for those who are just tuning in, this is our show where we discuss amazing artists from across history who have dedicated their lives to the creation and pursuit of magic, right? Yes. And it wasn't our first episode, but sort of we did a previous kind of episode together on Antonin Artaud, and we discussed how he is sort of like our, our quintessential dragon figure, someone who truly embraced magic in the pursuit of magic and used it to transform themselves in their art, right? Yeah. He is very so, much like our gold standard of dragon. Our gold, <laughs> our gold standard dragon, so to speak. And it brings us to today's character, which is um, Le Comte de Mont... De, sorry, Comte de L'Autremont, or Isidore Ducasse, who is a... Uh, a, would you say he was from Uruguay? From Uruguay. A Uruguayan artist who was also a major influence on Arto. So wh why don't you start telling us about uh, Ducasse and, and what Arto thought about him? Sure. So uh, should we just start with a biography? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so Isidore Ducasse was born in Montevideo, which is the capital of Uruguay, April 4th, 1846. And what's important to note is that he was raised speaking French, Spanish, and English. And this would provide a, a lot of access to a rich vein of literature later in his life. Wow. And unfortunately, in 1851, there was the siege of Montevideo during the Uruguayan-Argentine War. And uh, this, I think, greatly affected him as a child, you know, being exposed to, to war at such a young age, which definitely informed, I think, some of the darker nature of his work. And then in 1859, his dad sent him to France, uh, to Tarbes, T-A-R-B-E-S, not quite sure how to pronounce it, um, for high school. And he learned rhetoric, philosophy, arithmetic, and he also took his stab at drawing, which he was quite proficient at apparently apparently so was he sent by himself to, uh, to his, his dad sent him with and his dad paid for his school and his lodging and stuff but he's all by himself do you know how old he is this is 1859 he was born in 1846 so he's 13 can you imagine that at 13 years old due to war being separated from your family sent to another country where you don't even speak the pr primary language like, that sounds incredible. Very intense. And uh, it was during his school period that he read a lot of, um, like I was saying, he learned French, Spanish, and English. So he read a lot of uh, Edgar Allan Poe, Percy Shelley, Byron, Milton, Baudelaire, and, and, and many others. And so right from the beginning, we have this rich, gothic, but also classical, in, classically informed I guess, slant to literature that he loves. And um, I don't That's know. The thing I, I wanted to point out, though, is that with the uh, two other previous dragons we've talked about, they both cited Poe and Shelley and Byron as like major reasons for them to, to be writing, you know, and as huge influences. Yeah, it's very interesting how many of these magical artists uh, cite these writers as influence. It's, it's very fascinating. We'll have to do a deep dive on some of them. <laughs> oh, definitely. They're on the list. You know it's coming. Yeah. So uh, during this time, I, I guess after he graduates, he moves to Paris in 1867. And he lives in a hotel. I can't remember the name of the hotel, but they, they, they do know which hotel he was living in. And during this time, he frequented many libraries and read tons of romantic literature. And this will greatly shine through in his writing, um, and coupled with the, uh, the passion for nature from his, from his childhood. And so he publishes the first, so the, the, the Songs of Maldor is, sick, is broken into six cantos. And he publishes the first one by itself, anonymously in 1867. Oh, that's um, interesting. Very interesting. I think due to maybe the content, he was reticent to release it under his own name because 
he would write lots of poetry and he was very lauded for his capabilities, um, but also was also known for very like dark content in his writing, even from early on. So he releases it anonymously. And then later, I believe later that year, releases it again in a magazine under the name Le Comte de l'Autre Mont. And the full book is not completed until 1869. He sets up a publishing contract with the publisher La Croix, but after they, they print the copies, but La Croix decides that it's too disturbing of a content, and he was feared for he he afraid he was afraid of causing a disturbance in the populace and being accused of promoting blasphemy and obscenity. So oh, because wow. of this, he does not he ref, he refuses to release the copies of the book. Um. And then during this time, while waiting for this uh, Lacroix to make this decision, Ducasse releases two more short pieces of work, Le Poésie 1 and 2 in 1870. And they're sort of like a companion piece to Mal... They're like a, a complement to Maldorer. Okay. And, and he's still and, writing under like uh, the Lautremont pen name? Um, Poésie 1 and 2 were released under his own name, okay. under the name of Isidore Ducasse. Um, and then the war breaks out between uh, Paris, uh, between France and Prussia, I believe. And then Paris is besieged. Ducasse develops a bad fever, according to the hotel owner, and everyone just avoids him out of fear of the epidemic. And he doesn't die right away. He must have recovered and partially because he doesn't die until Thursday, 24th, November 1870 in his hotel room. So later that year. Due to unknown causes, that's what's that's what it says on his birth certificate. No known cause. Oh wow! So it so sounds like it's probably probably really really really. by this point he's twenty four. Twenty, so young. That's such a yeah. oh. so from thirteen to twenty four is his productive period in France, and that's it. Exactly, and that's all we get. Um, he released the songs of Maldor and the both of the poesie releases, and that's it. Oh, man. Um, he wrote numerous letters to friends, which I don't have any of his letters, unfortunately, but uh, supposedly they're brilliantly written and very evocative. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah that would be interesting, but I imagine like a lot of the the stuff with a lot of these, especially French or you know Spanish speaking, you know uh, literary fig figures, they tend not to translate the more personal stuff. It gets released, but it, it gets released in the original language. Exactly. You know, you know, unless it's something truly you know, you know, wild, but you know, it still would be worth worth checking out. But that's such a sad story too. Like they don't even know how to do it. It was probably complications from his his fever and Mount, you know, and being isolated. But wow! And by this point, uh, I believe his dad sort of renounced him and restricted funds that he was sending to him because of the songs of Maldor. If oh. I recall, um, I believe his parents didn't think too highly of it. I could be wrong, but I remember reading that in. Uh, I wouldn't in be my surprised. You 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 right. you know you're you're wild. You're, young man writing this very uh, provocative you know radical literature and prose and like you know on on daddy's dime no less right like that's uh, yeah, exactly <laughs> I think when i was looking i did a little bit of looking in there was a lot of people said that he helped he helped his own publishing in the start you know, with his own money and stuff. So, which would have been not his money, his dad's money. His you dad's know? money. Exactly. Yeah. And so the Songs of Outdoor was published after his death um, by a different publisher bought the copies from La Croix and released them. And I think, I think there was like 200 copies or something like that of the book. And as the story goes, supposedly... So like it's, it's it causes a bit of a stir and then it's forgotten when it's released, and then supposedly in 1917, the French writer Philippe Soupeau found a copy of Maldor in a small Parisian bookshop near the military hospital he was a patient at, and he was encapsulated by this book. Like he was just so enamored by it. He says, "I have to show this to my friend, who is his friend, none other than André Breton." 
the spearhead of the uh, surrealist movement. And oh, wow. he called the songs of Maldora, this is his quote, the expression of a revelation so complete it seems to exceed human potential. And no, in this no, way, <laughs> quite, quite the praise. And so in this way, Maldor becomes sort of the uh, dark progenitor of the surrealist movement. Maldor itself is not a surrealist work, as we discussed on Discord, um, but it has many elements that would be enticing to the surrealists, such as dreamlike sort of evocative landscapes, um, the dark content of it, the focus on cruelty, the uh, the renouncement of God and humanity and morality would be something that was very like enticing to the surrealists and would have excited them. Well, we were talking at the beginning, right, about Artaud. And Artaud, he yes. is a surrealist for a time, but I would not limit him to surrealism. No, he and was he briefly associated with the surrealists. Yeah, but he would be more associated or more evocative of this kind of Lautremont co current. You know, absolutely. I mean, the cruelty, right? Yeah, which Ma literally uses the term cruelty in the book, and you know, theater of cruelty with Arto. There has to be a connection there because Arto, in 1946, wrote a very profound letter on uh, Isidore de Cass and Lutrema, and it's fascinating. And I feel like he and he gives high praise to to Cass and his work and his letters. So I think that there's an obvious influence there. That's amazing. Wow, I love to hear that. So I wanna, before we dive into his work and start talking more about it, I wanted to discuss some of this name and in, in, in stuff because immediately when you showed it to me, as someone who knows a little bit of French, I, the, the words immediately dropped, jumped out to me, L'Autrema, right? Like that's, the other something, the other mountain, the other, the other way, the otherwise. And you have a whole passage there where it gets right into it. Do you want to go into yeah. that? Yeah, so this is by the author Audrey Sass. It's um, an intro to the copy of the Songs of Maldora that I have. And they say, what's in a name? L'autre mal, l'autre, the other. L'autre à Montevideo, because Ducasse, the son of a French consular officer, was born in Uruguay. Or Lotra Amon, the other um, the other Amon, a purported Grand Marquis of Hell who apparently governs forty infernal legions, or maybe as a prodigious stretch, Lotra on Amont via on Amont upstream, out of bourg or counter current or contra flow. Okay, there's so, so there's much to unpack there. there. Right? Yeah, so much. Like, okay, immediately when you're jumping out at me, though they want to connect Amon to the Goetic and the Solomonic magic tradition. And Amon is certainly there, but those of us with the ears to hear are immediately gonna connect this to the far more ancient Greco-Roman Hellenism and, and the Egyptian tradition and recognize that Amon is, is another name for Deus, for Zeus, right? And in the Greek tradition, there are two, there are always two, male gods, two king men who wield the scepter. There is the god on high in Olympus, and then there's the god of the underworld, right? Often this is Dionysus, sometimes it's Pluton, right? On, on, on high you have, you know, it changes several times, Uranus to Kronos to Zeus. So calling himself the other Amun, to me this immediately says he's identifying himself with the Chthonic Amon, Dionysus, Pluton, Hades, you know, Saturn, all of that, you know, which is freaking wild. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a bold statement to uh, to come up with a name that has such a powerful resonance with it, you know. <laughs> right, but it's it's not even just that because let's say it isn't like it wasn't Lotra Amon, right? What if it was the other one they said where it's upstream against the current? That's still a Chthonic so, Greek right. image. It because is. What is Rhea? Rhea is the flow of the stream, right? That's the mother goddess. That's the, the feminine aspect of Kronos. So if you're going against the flow, you're, you're, you're fighting against the powers that be. Are you fighting against Hera? Are you going <laughs> for Rhea? It gets really interesting. There's... <laughs> 
you can immediately just thinking about that passage in the name, you know that this guy is is into some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And then the other thing that stood out when we were talking, you know, Le Chant de Maladon or Maldor Mal When I heard yeah. that Maldoror, it's it sounds like Mal Odor, which would be like a, a bad smell. Oh. Mal Odious. Yeah. You know, which was immediately what I thought. And then you told me there's a whole passage in the book where he talks about the smells that you need to smell as part of the yeah. message. <laughs> <laughs> which is just like so freaking wild. Yeah, we're, we're going to read that passage in a bit because it's really fascinating. And it's just like, as soon as I saw this passage, I said, okay, this guy, this guy knows something. <laughs> right? And, you know, for those... We always talk about ears to hear, but there's also the the nose to to smell. You know, um, our good friend. Um, shout out to our good friend Mandy. Um, our, and Graham is actually published in this book. He wrote a whole book on uh, nose gnosis, where he went through Nietzsche, and he basically selected every passage that Nietzsche talks about smells. You know, and as we know, Nietzsche is definitely a dragon. Anyway, that was just a. a a, a random side <laughs> tangent, but going back to this um, Mal d'Aurore, you were you're saying that your book had a really good explanation that's even a little more deep than just bad smell. Yeah, yeah, I can't. It's on my phone, and if I minimize it, then it'll disconnect me. But uh, you don't. Have, oh, actually, I can pull it up on Facebook really quick because it's an important passage. I think. It's very important to discuss. Um, yeah, there's this thing that we're immediately confronted with, with just the titles where this is a person who's playing with puns. He's playing with your, your expectations and language. You know, this is, this is, a, this is a poetic person, you know, <laughs> it's wild. I love it. Oh, it's so wild. Um, I don't know if I can find the passage, unfortunately. Oh, don't worry. We can, we can, We'll, we'll come back around or yeah yeah we'll on the discord uh, it's very evocative um so the main reason i wanted to talk about this book in particular the songs of maldor is because i detected very strong indications of a magical intent when he wrote this piece of work and the reason i say that is because um can i read the first uh well, no, we won't get into the reading yet. But basically, yeah. the, purpose of the, the purpose of the book is to present a figure that has renounced God and humanity and morality. This is a figure so terrible and vile that to read of his acts will redouble and redouble again the reader's disdain for such behavior and strengthen the virtues and morality they hold within themselves. And in this way, Maldor can be seen as a magical vessel with the purpose of spiritual purgation. See, that, that is so revealing and so amazing because we were talking about this earlier when I was doing my, uh, I did a little bit of an analysis into, into some of the, the people who were talking about him. And they immediately, he's identified within the, the, the literary canon as helping to promulgate and create the modern concept of evil, you know? And, and and to really define this idea of evil. And as we understand, right, like within the mystery tradition, evil is a form of catharsis. The engagement of evil and tragedy and horror is, 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 is to be a reflecting thing. It's to be a mirror. It's so that you can process and deal with these kinds of images, you know. And a lot of uh, the scholars that I was reading were connecting uh, Lotrema Ducasse to Byron, you know, in his radical depiction of evil through the rejection, through his character of Lucifer and his talk of incest with his sister, um, and also to de Sade in his rampant just exploration of vileness and filth. And a lot of people were really were drawing even more parallels between Byron, or sorry, between Sa Saad and, and Lotremont. Because of just the the, the, the the sheer disgustingness of the content. <laughs> and, the, you know, and what they're saying is that they're both are very, really dense and hard to read prose that like 
Yes. Um, the sad because it's like a list of just the most disgusting things ever. So why would you ever read this? <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not saying that the sad is not with literary value. He clearly is of great literary value and helped challenge the world. But at the same time, I'm not reading him. <laughs> so. It's very true. Whereas Lotus of All, on the other hand, does have this abject vileness but he presents it through a lens of masterful prose mm. and that really elevates it to a new level i think is just his sheer capability as a writer um just it's so evocative these lengthy dreamlike passages evoking darkness and nature and the disdain for the creator <laughs> I love it. And you know, and this whole idea of the of that we see that comes out in the Victorian age of this rebellious person, right? That we see talked about in Byron and Shelley, these these people who can who who reject the unreasoned um tyranny of the old religion and espouse the reason and the light of of um of classicism in many ways you know at least with byron and with shelley do you see that same kind of um talk of like hellenism and classicism in maldoror or did you notice yeah. those things? so I, I think there is a there is a little bit i think it's mostly buried or obscured you know, so like there's lots of um, it's not so much Hellenistic in the content, but in the style in which is presented, I would say. Right. This engagement with evil and and OK, re interesting. So I'm going to bring up some pictures here before we get into the pros, sure. just so that we have like some idea. So yeah. here we have this is you're saying this is the only known photo of Isidore, right? Or one of them. Yeah. Wow. And the only one of the other pictures I could find was a drawing of him by another artist. Wow. And, we, you know, he's probably in his young, early 20s here, you know? Yeah. This is probably just before uh, his passing, I would say. And wow. then and then this is the copy that I have of the Songs of Maldor. It was released by Infinity Land Press last year. I believe translated by RJ, RJ Dent. And wow. it is fascinating. I had wanted to read this for a long time, and then I saw this new edition come out, and I said, oh, well, now is the perfect time to dive into it. So I'm really only familiar with this book for the past year, but I'd heard of it. Right. Through our toe well, and through many other writers and stuff. And uh, there's lots of bands that cite oh, Melbourne. Sure. So this oh, before, is a, before yeah. we leave, I just want to give a shout out to Infinity Land Press. They do some of the best kind of um, neo uh, classical and occult, and just like generally this, I don't know. What, they, they run the gamut of really interesting dark literature. Let's say that they do. <laughs> they are very dedicated to bringing Arto into the English language, which I love. Right. Um, and uh, that's how I discovered this. The Infinity Land Press was through some Arto publications, and then I just ended up loving a lot of other material that they've been releasing. <laughs> and like the quality of this book is next level. You were showing me that your your version there, hardcover, just uh, as a book, as a bibliophile, I love it. So, <laughs> so, like, so what's important to note here: these illustrations. These are from an an edition that was illustrated by Salvador Dali. Oh, wow. So, yeah, definitely influential to the Surrealists. If, if Very King the Surrealist himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I wish I, <laughs> I wish I had this edition. I don't know how rare it is, mm. uh, but it's worth looking into just yeah. for the illustrations alone. Beautiful pen drawings there. And here we have the, uh, this is the first original publication of the first canto of the Songs of Maldor. So this is, this is the uh, anonymous edition that he published. Wow. Yeah. The first, the first song. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, let's get into some of this reading here uh, before actually, well, so what is the general like theme of the book? How does right. the book open up? What is it really about? Does it have like a central literary arc or, or story? You know, we've been talking right. all 
about the accolades, but not really about the content. About the book. <laughs> so the content of the book is uh, is from the perspective uh, it's uh, all being written by this character he invents named Maldorer. And it's about, it's a series of dreamlike sequences that follow just many of his dark escapades. Okay. Uh, so there isn't really a linear narrative inside of it. Um, although each of these sequences themselves have a narrative to them. Right. And you were telling me that he often will change even voices within the single prose without even like yeah. notifying the reader. <laughs> a bit difficult, a bit difficulty um, demarking which character is speaking sometimes because it's just these big blocks of prose and then the dialogue is interspersed throughout. Interesting. So let's bring up the first uh, canto here. Right. So this is how this is how it opens. I love to. I love reading this this passage. Heaven grant that the reader at this moment, as brave and ferocious as the words now being read, may, without being disoriented, find a savagely dangerous path that leads through the desolate swamps of these solemn poison-soaked pages. For unless a rigorous logic and concentration of the mind equal to defiance is brought to this reading, the deadly emanations of this book will dissolve the soul as water does sugar. It is not right that everyone read the pages that follow. Very few will be able to taste this bitter fruit without danger. Consequently, timid soul, before penetrating any further into such uncharted regions, stop, turn around, go no further. Oh, wow. What a call to mystery. What a way to open your passage. That is, that is the opening passage of the Songs of Maldorer. And a direct uh, challenge on your reader. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> you can't handle the truth. And unlike Dante, abandon all hope ye who enter here, he's saying, don't even go in. Yeah. Let's turn yeah. around. Don't even, don't even try, man. The abyss, the abyss is gonna change you. Don't even bother yeah. with the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's saying right from the beginning, you know, this is not for everyone, you have to have a, def a spiritual defiance that you bring into this work in order to survive it. Oh, I love it. And some of that imagery right from the beginning, disoriented, find a savagely dangerous path through the desolate swamps of the sullen poison soaked pages. Like, whoa. Yeah, Ooh. he has such colorful writing that it is just a delight to read. Um, read okay. so Let's go to the next passage, because this is where he talks about the nose gnosis, which okay. I think is very important. So he says, this is uh, shortly after the intro. He says, reader, perhaps you would like me to invoke hatred at the start of this work. How do you know you will not sniff for as long as you want with your wide, thin, proud nostrils and be bathed in innumerable sensual delights or else turn belly up like a shark in the beautiful black air? It is as if you understand the importance of this act and the equal importance of your legitimate hunger, slow and majestically, your red emanations. However, O oh monster, I can assure you that the two formless holes of your hideous snout will be delighted by them, if you always endeavor to breathe in three thousand times the accursed conscience of the contentment of immobile ecstasy, will not ask for anything better of space, having been embalmed in perfumes and incense, for they will be satisfied with a complete happiness, like the angels who live in the magnificence and peace of pleasant heaven. <laughs> oh, wow. That is so incredible. So much crazy stuff. So like, much to unpack in every single passage that it was hard to choose which ones to, to present, to be honest. But I felt like this was really integral with the uh, those with the snout to sniff, you know? <laughs> exactly. Those with the snout to sniff. That's our new phrase. Oh, wow. That, that is so crazy. And you know what? Immediately, I'm, I'm, this is evoking dragon imagery. Right, this, the, the the breathing through the nostrils of your hideous snout. Right, he's using that dragon imagery. That this is clearly someone who has the ears to hear. Like, this is no, so. Yeah. I, he spent so many times in libraries. He had to have dug up a lot of this ancient mysticism, you know. And he was yeah. so steeped in romantic literature too that he would have recognized a lot of this this the symbols. Oh, definitely. Right. And I, I also think immediately of like the Egyptian process of mummification, 
you know, being involved in perfume you're too. ripping out of your brain through your nose, right? Like, ah. Uh. Be embalming in perfumes and incense. Exactly. There's so much. There's so much going on here in in this little passage. I know it blew <laughs> my mind. Your nose in the monsters who smell people. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's saying that if you breathe in the auras, the the scent of this book, you will be delighted. If you know what to smell for. Right. That's you have to be able to process the bitter fruit, you know? This isn't just a dark piece of work. This is a piece of work with a purpose. Right. And, you know, this image of the bitter fruit that he evokes, too, is very important because that's another mystery image. The pomegranate is a bitter fruit, right? We always describe things as, as a hard, the bitter fruit to swallow, you know? It, it, it's uh, very interesting. Oh, very interesting. Wow. And so we could go to the next passage because it's important also for setting the stage. Um, he says, there are some who write for human praise by means of the noble qualities of the heart and their, that, that their imagination invents or that they may have. Me, I use my genius to portray the delights of cruelty, not momentary artificial delights, but ones that started with man and will finish with him. Cannot genius ally itself with cruelty and the secret resolutions of providence? Or because one is cruel, can't one have genius? The proof is in my words. All you have to do is listen to me if you want to. So this here is the agenda of the book that he's stating very explicitly. Yeah. You know, it's a book that is centered around cruelty, the cruelty of humanity, the cruelty that we instill on one another, the cruelty that God instills on us. This is the most, like, Artaud thing I've ever read that's not written by Artaud, I think. I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, it could, you could, if you told me this was an Artaud passage, I wouldn't bat an eye. Because it's, <laughs> it's the same imagery. But I also want to point out, like, this is a similar theme that we see with a lot of these kind of magically orientated artists, which is this engagement with, you know, Kawain talks about this a lot in his poetry, the duality of nature and, and how it's nature is all beauty, you know? So what we perceive as evil and disgusting through the eyes of the magician is still the beautiful, you know? And it's still that raw nature that we worship, you know? You want to go to the haunts of Pan to observe the satyrs and their dances of cruelty. You know, as as shocking as those images are, we are drawn to them. Like Pentheus, we can't help but look, even though we know the Bacchants are going to rip us apart. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, and it also, it makes me think, it reminds me too, that a lot of these great artists who are engaging with magic, again, there is a rejection of materialism. You know, if there is any materialism within these men, it's of the aesthetic kind. And, but it's a rejection outright of greed and of money. You know, that's a very important theme. Absolutely. But yeah, sorry, let's keep going. <laughs> oh, okay, man, that's okay. So this next passage, um, this is the first after this is the first sequence after the introduction. So he sort of spends a while, several pages, expanding on what he means by cruelty and defining this Maldor character as being like purely vile and evil. And then he says, this is, this is Maldor. It's all written from the perspective of Maldor, even though it's saying, and what will Maldor do next? I believe it's him writing about himself in the third person. So oh, he wow. said, one should let one's nails grow for a fortnight. Oh, how sweet it is to brutally tear a child from its bed. A child with a bare upper lip and with wide open eyes pretend to gently touch his forehead and push back his beautiful hair. Then suddenly, when he least expects it, you force your long nails into his soft breast, but not so that he dies, for if he died, you would miss the sight of his agonies. Then you drink his blood by licking the wounds, and during this time, which would last as long as eternity, the child cries. 
Nothing is as good as his blood extracted thus and still warm, except his tears, bitter like salt. Man, have you ever tasted your own blood when you have accidentally cut your own finger? It's good, isn't it? For it has no taste. Besides, don't you remember how one day during your gloomy reflections, you raised your cupped hand to your sickly face made wet by the tears falling from your eyes? And then how you moved that hand towards your mouth and drank the tears from that cup in long drafts, your teeth chattering like those of a schoolboy who glances sideways at his born oppressor. They are good, aren't they? <laughs> Whoa! So this is the first like <laughs> real passage of the book. And she continues to describe that the child is blindfolded and bound. And he continues, he describes to continue tearing at the child's flesh. And then all of a sudden, Maldora retreats like an avalanche before rushing into the room again and removing the child's restraints and blindfolds and starts consoling them. And he says, how the heart overflows at being able to console the innocent that one has perpetrated evil against. Oh, my God. That is so, okay. Oh, again. Oh, man. That is so intense. There's so much to. <laughs> okay, it's just like I was, I should have known what I was getting into when people were comparing him to the side, but until you, yeah. your nose is right it's up in it. It's absolutely dark. It's quite, it's a violent piece of work. But it's important that we unpack this, okay? The ripping yeah. apart and attacking of a child, the engaging with the, the nails in the flesh. This is Maenadic. This is, this is Dianic. These are the Maeads. These are the Bacchants, right? What do they do? They rip apart their male child. Right, they rip apart the male child and consume the flesh and ecstasmos, you know. So he's evoking that image, but he's also he's evoking a much more dark and a much more prevalent and more immediate image that of the Catholic Church and of the exorcism practices of the Church of Alexandria, which Dr. Amon has talked about at length. Um, if you guys really want to go to a dark place. Check out our friend um, Amon's book on this. It's called um, Original Sin. But he documents um, they would do this exorcism ritual in Alexandria where they would abduct um, orphaned children, pagan orphan children. And the idea was you needed to transform the child into a pure vessel that would not that would be free from demon possession and be unable to be used by the pagans. And to do this, you had to put them through a, a, an experience of the devil. So the priest would purposely invoke the devil into the child. And then the child, by facing the devil, would come out um, abused, but unable, because he's been raped, to be possessed by demons and unable to, uh, to be more pure and be more um, manipulated into, the, into the, the rights of Christ. They would take these kids, and you can read all this. They'd starve them for several days, strip them, cover them in oil. Then the priest would 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 invoke the devil into himself, and then as the devil would rape the child, and they would command the child to to shout out the name of the devil, to 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 fight him off, you know, as to rebuke Satan. And by and if they could rebuke Satan in that moment. They were they were guaranteed heaven. So in this really creepy fucked up theology of the of these groups, this is what was going on. And that's the image that I see here. What they're doing to this child, torturing and hurting it, and then locking it up and 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 and, and then trying to see, oh, we didn't hurt you, we love you. Like it's that he said, uh, yeah, he pretends that it wasn't even him that did it. Because the child's blindfolded, right? He just says, oh, you horrible thing. What have they done to you? You precious, you precious thing. I'll take care of you. I'll love you and nurture you. Right? It was the devil that did that thing to you. It was evil. That was that external. But meanwhile, it's the parent. It's that loving figure, that authority. That is the one that commits the violence to the child. You know? Absolutely. It brings to mind like uh, almost like abusive parents yes very much that you know and there's nothing there's fewer 
mm, images that are more terrifying than the abusive parent because you know these are supposed to be the thing that you depend on the people who love you unconditionally this is why when you go back to the old fairy tales the monster is always the mother not the stepmother the mother or the father or both you know but that's the scariest thing that uh, our ancient cultures could conceive of is the mother turning on her children and the children being unable to process this because how can they you know exactly wow yeah oh i can't i'm still like <laughs> <laughs> you, for me. you prepared me for this and i'm still shocked it gets more intense from here <laughs> all right let's let okay so um, is there anything else you want to talk about on this passage before we move forward no i think we're good okay so this 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 is two short passages i'll read them in sequence um, this is from a, also from the first canto. He has this very long sequence where he has all these. Uh, it's like an ode to the ocean, and it's a very long passage. So I just extrapolated these two short little bits from it. You are swayed voluptuously by the soft effluvia of your own majestic slowness, which the grandest attribute the sovereign power has given you. In the midst of a somber mystery, with the calm sense of your eternal power, you unfurl your incomparable waves over your sublime surface. They follow each other parallel, but separated by short intervals. As one subsides, another grows and goes to meet it, accompanied by the melancholy noise of the dissolving foam that reminds us that all is foam. Thus human beings, those living waves, die in a monotonous way one after the, one after the other, but without making any frothing sound. Oh, then, wow. <laughs> so, does anyone see uh, the goddess here? <laughs> she's, 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 pretty, she's pretty prevalent in this passage. Yeah, and it's a, it's like several pages that goes on like this, of describing various attributes of the ocean. Swayed uh, voluptuously by the soft effluvia of your own majestic Sloan. I don't think I've ever heard a better descriptor of the of water. Like <laughs> that's insane. I and like it. growing up in Montevideo, you know, being so close to the coast, that has to be what informed the ocean, uh, the pulsing ocean, you know. And then he says, Tell me then if you are the abode of the Prince of Darkness. Tell me, ocean, tell only me, so as not to upset those who have only ever known illusions. If the breath of Satan created the storms that whirl your salt waters to the clouds. This you must tell me, because I would rejoice in the knowledge that hell is so close to man. I want this to be the last stanza of my invocation. Consequently, I would greet you one more time, then say goodbye. Old ocean with crystal waves, my eyes are wet with the abundant tears, and I do not have the strength to continue. For I feel that the time has come to return among men with their brutish appearance. But courage, let us make a great effort and accomplish with a sense of duty our destiny on this earth. I salute you, old ocean. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Now we get in the devil. Created the storms, the worlds, that your salt, the clouds, right? Like, the storms in, the, in, in, in that this is evocative like in the earliest of the greek traditions right poseidon is often seen as the satanic figure the true ruler of the underworld you know and what is the abyss in many cultures right? right and it's the mere image of of aphrodite who's the who we got in the first passage who is the foam the sea foam right and he describes that thing right like you're being dissolved into the foam Reminds us that all is foam, that all is of that mother, of that churn, right? That's so profound. And then you get the reverse image, that dark <laughs> image, the, the dark, you know, like, oh, wow. I love this. This is really crazy. And I, I just love that he says, let us make a great effort and accomplish with a sense of duty our destiny on this earth. Because to Maldorer, his destiny is to inflict cruelty and pain upon everyone he encounters. 
So it's sort of like this grand, like, yes, we will accomplish our destiny. But for him, it's like, I will accomplish my destiny. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, the time, there, is a, there, is a, there is a deep thing here, okay? So um, this is a theme. Uh, are you familiar with Dune at all? The series I Dune. only read um, Dune and Dune Messiah. Okay. Oh, the you need to. You need to. Okay. You have not read Dune then because you have not got to the great tragedy. And many people never get to the great tragedy. The great tragedy is the God Emperor. Okay. And uh, Frank Herbert was a classicist. And I think that both uh, Lotramont and Herbert are reacting to this same image that we see within classicism that uh oh, in hellenism sorry that of the tyrant the formidable tyrant and what is the purpose of the tyranny of evil what why does evil exist what is its function within the system and what herbert shows us is that the function of the tyrant is to force change by imposing restriction and by imposing tyranny and becoming that evil, becoming that other, it forces humanity to adapt and to reject the things that oppressed it, you know, to see its own limitations and to move beyond them. So the villain, the tyrant is necessary. This Saturn figure with the knife who stands behind you telling you to jump off the cliff or die, it's a very necessary force. Otherwise, you'd never jump off the cliff, ever. You know, so there's this whole thing where we have to engage and face that which is most fearful, that which is most terrifying. And this image of time, that unrelenting process of time that has no care for you, that'll just mow over you. Is there anything more dangerous than that? You know, <laughs> it's true. Wow. So lots just brimming with imagery already, and we're still in the first canto. <laughs> right? Just incredible stuff here, you know? And the abode of the Prince of Darkness is the underwater. You know? yeah. <laughs> There's so much going on here. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, I love it. Okay, let's keep going. So now we have the, this. This is from a different passage, a, a different dream, a sort of like sequence, I guess. And um, it's about a mother, and it's about a family, and the mother is sort of like praying, and then th there's chatter in between the family members, but it's hard to kind of tell sometimes who's speaking, at least for me, anyways. But this is from the perspective of the mother. And here we have the uh, example that he uses of repetition in a very dreamlike, almost mantra-esque way throughout the rest of the book. So he says, In the distance, I hear the prolonged screams of the most poignant anguish. May it please heaven that his birth is not a calamity for his country, which has driven him from his breast. He goes from country to country, hated everywhere. Some say he has been afflicted with a unique kind of madness since childhood. Others believe he is extremely and instinctively cruel, that he is ashamed of this, and that his parents died of sorrow. There were some who claim he was given a particular name in his youth, and has been inconsolable ever since, mainly because his injured dignity saw proof of the blatant wickedness of men, which was obvious to him in his earlier years, became even more obvious later. That name was the Vampire. In the distance, I hear the prolonged screams of the most poignant anguish. They add that day and night, without rest or relief, horrible nightmares induce bleeding from his mouth and ears, and that specters sit by his bed, and in spite of themselves are impelled by an unknown force, their voice is sometimes sweet, sometimes like battle roars, to relentlessly shout in his face this name, the name that is always perennial, always hideous, and which will only perish with the universe. Some even assert that love reduced him to this state, or that these cries testify to his repentance of some crime buried in the night of his mysterious past. But most think that he is tortured by immeasurable pride, as was Satan, and that he wants to equal God. In the distance, I hear the prolonged screams of the most poignant anguish. So she's talking about Maldora here, and warning her son of his evil, and describing some of his potential origins. 
And just that mantra in the distance, like either prolonged screams or the most poignant anguish, you'd almost hear it in like a choral sort of tone, you know? And it, she, he says it many more times throughout this sequence. Oh, wow. Um, and like this weird mantra-esque sort of thing. It's very cool. I love it. The most poignant anguish. The name was the vampire. But the question I always have when I see this stuff about God, like who who is the vampire, right? Who who is God and who is Satan in these stories? You know, exactly. <laughs> As we'll come to see very soon, uh, there's a reason why Maldor is so evil and cruel. And it has to do with the creator and his relationship with him. Of course it does. <laughs> uh, and early after in this same sequence, or in the, in the next sequence, is introduced yeah, okay. to, by this one sentence. I don't have it in a slide, but he just says, He who did not know how to cry because he has always suppressed his inner suffering. That is how Maldor is described at the beginning of one of these sequences. And oh, I think man. I think that's important. That is such a evocative image because I automatically that to me I think of someone who has been totally dis, just 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 uh, you know um is beholden to this image of toxic masculinity or beholden to that toxicity to their own, you know, like you can't cry. What do you mean you can't cry? Right, exactly. the like cathartic release. Right, you have to be able to to embrace change, and you have to face your fears. And and, and you know, like that's how you cope. You, you you if you can't cry, you can't cope. You know, no, <laughs> exactly. You can't move on if you don't process the the suffering that you've endured. Oh wow! And that's why he's so defined by suffering. Suffering becomes his his entire being. You know, he, he only exists to experience it and to inflict it. Exactly. And so now we come to the second canto. I, I just have two passages from the second canto. One of them is a bit longer. This first one, I don't know if we need to read all of it, but the, the important imagery in this passage that I just want to get across is that Maldor is trying to continue writing his, in the sequence, Maldor is attempting to write more of his passages and he feels paralyzed and then he gets up and he goes to the window and he sees a storm and lightning flashes and this blast of lightning comes through the window and separates him from the forehead down to the chin and it scars him he says poor young man your face was already marked with wrinkles and a birthmark it did not really need this long sulfurous scar too what do the storm and paralysis of my fingers mean? Is it a warning from on high to stop writing and to make me consider the risks I run by distilling the drool from my square mouth? But this storm did not frighten me. What would a legion of thunderstorms matter to me? These celestial policemen perform their difficult duties zealously, as if I am to judge summarily by my injured forehead. I do not have to thank the Almighty for his remarkable skill. He aimed the lightning so that it would cut my face exactly in two, from the forehead, where the injury was the most dangerous, down. Let someone else congratulate him. But these storms attack someone who is stronger than they. Well then, horrible viper-faced eternal one, not content with placing my soul between the frontiers of madness and these furious thoughts that are slowly killing me. You also decided, after mature consideration, that befitted your majesty to make a stream of blood gush out of my forehead. But what can I tell you? You know that I do not love you, that on the contrary I hate you, so why do you insist? When will your conduct stop being dressed in the clothes of strangeness? Tell me frankly as you would a friend, do you not think that you show in your abhorrent persecution a naive eagerness which is so ridiculous that no seraphim of yours would ever dare to point it out to you? What makes you so angry? Know that if you let me live in peace, free from torment, I would be grateful to you. So he's attacked by God, and then he's challenging him, saying, that's nothing. My flesh is stronger than what anything you can dish upon me, you know? And I think this image is important of the lightning, which is almost like a symbol of Zeus and attempting to split him down the middle. Well, this is also, are you familiar with the, with the story of Zeus and the primordial people? Yes. You know, and how originally human beings were originally two people attached at the back. 
by gendered yeah by gendered beings and zeus out of fear that they would eventually rise to replace him split them in half to keep them at war and to keep them separated you know exactly so they couldn't so realize they were a whole being you know exactly so this reminds me of that but he failed at splitting him he cut his face but he himself is not split you know because he's stronger is more powerful than God may have anticipated. He can also see his own duality. This is a person who recognizes the two sides of himself and has united them as a whole, right? He's crossed the abyss, is what he's telling you. And he's, you know, he's a, he's 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 no longer separated by those gendered binaries, you know? He's, exactly. he's trying to invoke the, the Fonies. Oh, wow. Beautiful stuff. So and so the next passage is very long. I, I, I'd like to read it though. And it's it, this yeah, is, sure. this is a, it's very central to the piece. This is a, it goes, it, Maldor is calling back to his past now, his adolescence. So we get a bit of a glimpse into where Maldor came from and why he is this cruel. He says, it is said that I was born in the arms of deafness. In the first years of my childhood, I cannot hear what was said to me. When, with the greatest difficulty, they managed to teach me to speak, it was only after reading what someone had written on a piece of paper that I could, in turn, communicate the gist of my thoughts. One day, unhappy day, I had grown in beauty and innocence, and everyone admired the intelligence and the goodness of this divine youth. But no... I knew only too well that the happy roses of adolescence that were woven into capricious garlands around his modest and noble brow, which all the mothers would kiss with frenzied devotion, did not bloom perpetually. It was beginning to seem to me that the universe, with its starry vault of impassive and annoying globes, was perhaps not as grandiose as I had dreamed. And so one day, tired of trudging along the steep trail of this earthly journey, and of staggering like a drunken man through life's dark catacombs, I slowly raised my splenetic eyes, ringed with large bluish circles, towards the concavity of the firmament, and I, so young, dared to penetrate the mysteries of heaven. Not finding what I was looking for, I lifted my eyes higher, then higher still, until I saw a throne made of human excrement and gold, and on which was sitting, with idiotic pride, his body covered in a shroud of unwashed hospital sheets, he who calls himself the creator. He held the torso of a rotting corpse in his hand, and was carrying it, in turn, from his eyes to his nose, and from his nose to his mouth. Once in his mouth, we can guess what he did with it. His feet were resting in a large pool of boiling blood, to the surface of which two or three cautious heads would rise suddenly like tapeworms in a chamber pot, and submerge again immediately with the speed of an arrow. A kick well applied to the nose bone was the usual reward for any infringement of regulations caused by the need to breathe another element. For ultimately, these men were not fish. Amphibious at best, they swam underwater in that vile liquid, until, finding his hands empty, the creator, with the first two claws of his foot, would seize another diver by the neck as though with pincers and lift him into the air out of the reddish slime, exquisite sauce, and there he would be dealt with like the others. First of all, he devoured their heads, legs, and arms, and finally the trunk, until nothing more remained, for he crunched the bones. Sometimes he exclaimed, I created you, therefore I have the right to do whatever I wish to you. You've done nothing to me, I do not deny. For my pleasure, I make you suffer. And he returned to his cruel meal, moving his lower jaw, which moved his brain-matted beard. Oh, reader, does not the last detail make your mouth water? Such brains are not for just anyone, good and fresh, as though only caught a quarter of an hour ago in a lake full of fish. My limbs were paralyzed, and my throat silenced as I contemplated the scene for some time. Three times I nearly collapsed, like a man who undergoes too strong an emotion. Three times I managed to remain on my feet. Not a fiber of my body remained motionless, and I shook and trembled like the lava inside a volcano. In the end, with my chest so constricted, I was unable to breathe in the life-giving air quickly enough. My lips opened involuntarily, and I uttered a cry so piercing that I heard it. 
The buffers of my ear were abruptly shaken loose. My eardrums cracked under the shock of this resounding air mass. Forced from me with such energy, and a new phenomenon took place in the body condemned by nature. I had just heard a sound. A fifth sense had formed inside me. But what pleasure could I derive from such a discovery? Since then, no human sound has reached my ear without being accompanied by the feeling of sorrow which pity for a great injustice causes. Whenever someone spoke to me, I remembered what I had seen one day above the visible spheres and translated my suffocated feelings into an impetuous howl, the tone of which was identical to that of my fellow men. I could not answer him. For the tortures inflicted on man's weakness in that hideous crimson sea passed in front of my face, bellowing like a flayed roaring elephant and brushing its, brushing its fiery wings against my burnt hair. All that is long since over. For a long time now, I have spoken to no one. Oh, you, whoever you are, when you're beside me, do not let any sound escape your vocal cords. Do not use your larynx to try and surpass the nightingale, and do not attempt to let your soul be known to me by your use of language. Keep a religious silence that nothing interrupts. Cross your hands humbly on your chest and lower your eyes. I have told you this, and since that vision showed me the supreme truth, many nightmares have eagerly sucked at my throat, night and day, for having the courage to renew, even by thought, the suffering I experienced during that infernal hour, which continues unabated in my memory. Oh my! <laughs> there is a long passage, but there is so much to unpack here. There is so much. We're not we're not gonna be able to do this justice, but we that's can try. Fair, that's fair. <laughs> so what's important is that he was deaf for most of his life, and then he has this horrifying vision of the creator that is so you know, this is the sublime, the mingling of awe and terror, right? And it is so overwhelming that he screams a scream that he can actually hear and he learned he's no longer deaf because of this revelation. And it is so this revelation that turns him against the creator, that it fortifies his disdain for all creation. Because this, like, is what, this is what's waiting for you when you die, if you go to heaven. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And, like, oh, okay. The ending there, he's hearing the musical spheres. He's hearing and experiencing the heaven. He's learning that he learns the dragon tongue. This is what he's describing. To the, he learns how to communicate with deity, and he's repulsed by it as soon as he, you know. And the, this is the thing. It's okay. That image we have of the creator, okay, this is what happens to all people who sit upon the throne within the, the Hellenistic tradition, okay. You know, Kronos, when he comes up, he's a young, powerful figure who slays the tyrant Uranos. And he ushers in the golden age of peace and harmony that the Romans always talk about. But eventually, he becomes the tyrant who does what? Eats his own children. And there's also another thing there that you talk about how his, 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 his throne is covered in filth. This, there's, a con, there's a excrement, yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's an epithet or series of epithets that you'll see for, for various gods and goddesses. I think um, Hecate has this as well as Dionysus and Zeus, the one who eats filth, uh -huh. you know? And there's this, all this imagery about Dionysus, the ambrosia that he's drinking is excrement. Oh, wow. Right? The, 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 the power of Dionys of the gods is turning excrement into ambrosia. You know, and it's from the death and destruction that they're able to create. They have that transformative power, you know, but it's just so terrifying. This image of Saturn, I have not seen a more terrifying image of Saturn Kronos. The only one that comes close, and we will definitely talk about them on this show, is Goya and his black paintings. You know, that the, the yeah. image of, of, of Saturn devouring his son, where you just see the bloody torso, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah, it's it's such gritty gritty powerful imagery that i just i, I said you're gonna love this passage 
<laughs> oh man, don't I ever love it? This is this is yeah, this is what we live for. This is this is why you rebel against the tyrant. This is what the, the tyrant is a madman who's sitting there consuming what he, what he creates. In, in living in shit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> just for all we have to love him. <laughs> all eternity just pulling his creation out of this slime and just eating them. And then condemning them as he's eating them, telling them that I made you and I'm allowed to make you suffer like this. You right. know? It's like you so much for my amusement, you know? <laughs> And I, I keep thinking of this this classic Hellenistic image that you get within the within the cult of um, of Sibylle Rhea, where they talk about the, the 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 dark waters where the nymphs lay, and how Attis is bound into the dark waters, and he has to, and or you know, in the dark waters, there's it's 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 filth and disgusting, and it's all of the negativity, right, and and all of the 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 horribleness of, of matter and part of the story of Addis is he, he rejects the matter, you know, he actually castrates himself and, and turns to the goddess to try and become a, to be returned and become a woman to, to literally reject all of that creation, that, that masculinity, that throne, that power, because it's just so disgusting. <laughs> At least one that's, I'm not saying that's the totality of the image, but this is one, one reflection of that image, right? Can be very <laughs> disgusting. So wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so in another in another in another sequence from the second canto, just a little quip here. He says, I cannot sleep. When am I supposed to sleep? Yet nature needs to claim her rights. As I disdain her, she makes my face pale and my eyes shine with the bitter flame of fever. So he is also talking about, despite all this nature evocation in throughout the, the throughout the book, he um, speaks of it in like a dark a dark nature sense, sort of, and he is almost horrified by it, and his inability to connect with it is slowly destroying him because we need to connect to nature. I also just want to point out how bloody insane. And, and 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 how truly rebellious this would have been in 1870s right in 1870s catholic france no less to call god an ins an, a crazy person who's cannibalizing people for his own amusement living in shit yeah yeah like <laughs> Like, holy frig, man. There's that, a reason there's a reason Lacroix did not want to publish this work out of fear of being like reprimanded, you know? Ah, uh, no guff. No guff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised this ever saw print, you know? I'm surprised that those 200 copies didn't get destroyed. I know? know. That was the next slide is just part of the same passage. So we'll okay. go now to uh we'll go to slide 10. Okay. So this is the third canto. I need to give a trigger warning here. This is a longer passage that is, this is the most disturbing passage in the entire book. And I felt it was important to have here because it sort of reaffirms everything vile about him, about Maldor. And this is the, this, this is what we're supposed to find our souls revulsed by. And this is what is a, we need to fortify our spirit against. This is like the ultimate cruelty. And so we have pedophilia, sexual assault and extreme violence. And for these reasons, I need to give a trigger warning. So maybe for people who are sensitive to that topic, come back in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, please do. As you've already seen, we already had violence against children. So yeah, and it gets, dark. it gets a lot worse. Okay, so please don't hurt yourselves if these things are triggers for yourself. You know, we yeah. engage with this kind of literature as a form of of coping with the with the horrors of life. You know, this is not a celebration of violence as a um, an affirmation against it. We need to stand Saturn. against Saturn. We must overthrow Saturn, right? <laughs> I myself have been a victim of sexual violence, and I wouldn't include this passage if I didn't think it was important. Thank you for saying that. So without further ado, this is the sequence that I've dubbed the Mad Woman. 
Here is the mad woman dancing while she vaguely remembers something. Children chase her and throw stones at her if she, as if she were a blackbird. She brandishes a stick and looks about to chase them, then continues on her way. She does not notice that she has left only one of her shoes on the path. Long spiders move along her neck, but they are only her hair. Her face no longer resembles the human face, and she bursts into fits of laughter like a hyena. She lets, scraps, she lets slip scraps of sentences in which, when put together, very few would find any clear meaning. Hold in many places, her dress moves jerkily around her bony and mud-splashed legs. She drives herself forward like a poplar leaf blown along by the whirlwind of unconscious faculties. She glimpses her youth, her illusions, and her past happiness through the mists of a destroyed mind. The mad woman reproaches no one. She is too proud to complain and will die without having revealed her secret of those who are interested in her, but who she has forbidden to even address her. Children chase her and throw stones at her as if she were a blackbird. She has dropped a roll of paper from her bosom. A stranger picks it up, shuts himself up in his room all night with it, and reads the manuscript, which contains the following. And after many barren years, Providence sent me a daughter. For three days I knelt in churches and never ceased thanking the great name of him who had finally fulfilled my wishes. I was not to enjoy her presence for much longer. The time was approaching when she would, in an unexpected manner, have to make her farewells to life's charms, leaving the company of doves, grouse, and greenfinches, the babbling of the frogs, and the freshness of the streams. They told me what happened, because I was not present at the death of my daughter. Maldor was passing with his bulldog. He saw a young girl sleeping in the shade of a plane tree, and at first he took her for a rose. He quickly undressed like a man who knew what he was doing. Naked as a stone, he threw himself upon the girl's body, lifting her dress to commit an assault on her modesty. In broad daylight, it didn't bother him. Not him. Let us not dwell on this impure action. His mind discontent, he dressed quickly, glancing cautiously at the dusty road where no one was walking, and ordered the bulldog to strangle the blood-stained young girl with a snap of its jaws. He pointed out to the mountain dog the place where the victim was gasping and shrieking in pain and withdrew from the scene so as not to witness the sharp teeth sinking into rosy veins. Obeying this order appeared to be difficult for the bulldog. It thought its master was asking it to do what had already been done, and so this wolf, the monstrous muzzle, violated in turn the virginity of the delicate child. The blood flowed again from her torn stomach along her legs and onto the meadow. Maldorer, how loathsome to say the name, heard the agonized cries of pain and was surprised that the victim clung so hard to life that she was not yet dead. He approached the sacrificial altar and saw the conduct of his bulldog, satisfying its baser instincts. He gave it a kick and cut open one eye. The angered bulldog tore across the countryside, dragging after it the little girl's body, along a stretch of path, which although short was still too long, and which was only disentangled by the jerky movements of the creature as it ran, for it was afraid to attack its master, who would never see the dog again. Maldora took an American penknife, consisting of ten or twelve blades that served various purposes. He opened the angular claws of this steel hydra, and equipped with a scalpel-like implement, and seeing that the green of the grass had not yet been obliterated by so much spilled blood, prepared himself, without blanching, to carve out the insides of the hapless child's vagina. From the enlarged hole he withdrew successively the internal organs, intestines, lungs, liver, and finally the heart itself, were hacked from their foundations and pulled through the appalling opening into the light of day. The penknife was found a few steps away. A shepherd witnessed to the crime. Witness a shepherd. Sorry, a shepherd witnessed to the crime, who uh, was assured um, witness to the crime, whose perpetrator has never discovered. Only told of it long afterwards, when he was sure that the criminal had safely reached the frontier, and he himself had nothing to fear by way of retribution if he revealed it all. I pitied the madman who had committed this appalling crime, which the legislators had not foreseen and which had no precedence. I pitied him because it is likely that his reason was overcome with madness as he stabbed with the twelve-bladed knife, plowing through viscera from top to bottom, 
I pitied him because if he was not insane, his disgraceful conduct shows he had been hatching a great hatred against his fellow man in order to rage so furiously against the, fresh, the flesh and arteries of an innocent child, my daughter. I attended the funeral of those human remains with silent resignation, and every day I come and pray over her grave. At the end of the reading, the stranger loses all his strength and faints. He comes to and burns the manuscript. He will not buy a bulldog. He will not converse with the shepherds. He will not sleep in the plane tree's shade. Children chase the mad woman and throw stones at her as if she were a blackbird. Holy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I kind of lost myself there because it's just so disturbing. It kind of dissociated for a second. But um, yeah. this is the most vile atrocious part of this book and this is why we despise Maldora. this is why we despise everything that he does and he does this out of disdain for his fellow human for being a product of the creator which is so cruel and vile that he sees this evil in everyone and he has to destroy it that's so it really, oh man, I don't even, it's such a profound and, and shocking image. It's hard to to fully even grasp or process, but wow. <laughs> so we have, the mad woman. we have the mad woman to recap. We have a mad woman. She's following, she walks around, children chase her, they throw stones at her. She drops a manuscript, which someone reads, which entails this vile act. And uh, is so touched by it that he destroys it. And she continues every day to walk to her daughter's grave like a mad woman. And, you know, what I get from all of this and from the story is this reminder of the extreme evil that is perpetuated all around us that we don't see, that we are unprivy to, to these people that we take for granted and ignore and dismiss as mad women. You know, we don't know the true tragedy of their stories. And that image, too, that of Malador, I think Jack the Ripper. Have you ever read From Hell? Yeah. All I keep thinking is some evil Masonic prince from the royal family ripping people apart, you know? Like, oh, my God. And that would have been an image that would have been fairly contemporary at this time, I think. When was I got to look that up? When did when was Jack the Ripper? If it's before or after the 1870s, because like man. Not, you're 1860s, I guess, because this yeah. was published in 1870s. But let's see here. So oh, 1888. So no, Jack the Ripper's later. Jack Which the Ripper was inspired by Maldora, perhaps. <laughs> Jesus, but like ah. The evilest thing imaginable is what? R raping and mutilating of a young girl in the dissecting of her of her internal organs. That is the calling card of, uh, of Jack the Ripper. Oh, man. Yeah, so... <laughs> I don't really know what to say about it. I just thought well, it was important to include it. No, it is important that we include this, right? And it's, it's, it's again, it's this, how do we understand and process evil? How do we even handle it, right? Like, look at the response of the man who read the story. I'm never even going to own a bulldog. I'm never going to be able to never gonna sleep under a plane tree. I'm never going to talk to shepherds. Right? Right? That's a response at the mere mention of this kind of violence. Can you imagine if that happened to you or to someone you loved, right? This is why we need to be, you know, he's warning you. He's like, this kind of violence exists and it's real and we have to face it as a, as a society, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a life force, you know? And just also this hatred, like, like this, this hatred of life. In this and this hatred of the creator that it can become so profound that you want to take it out on that virgin, right? The young child. This is this. So this is something that happens. I, I guaranteed we're gonna have to get into um, George's um, what's his name, um, George Bataille, because Bataille yeah. talks a lot about this kind of stuff about sacrifice and this destruction of the pure and the, and the beautiful. 
And there's nothing seen as more pure and beautiful than the young child, the prepubescent girl, you know? I, you know? So it's like, ah, <laughs> that image is still, it's still the most profound and still the most shocking, right? Just like the rape of Persephone is the central moment of the rites, this image, the violence against the, the young child is still the image we engage with, with Mal Maldivar. When you want to think of the most vile thing, that's, that is it. Wow. Yeah. So I, I don't have too much more. Really. I only have a couple of like shorter passages left because I, I felt the need, didn't feel the need to go through the entire book for a variety of reasons. One for time, because some of these passages are quite long and two, because I want to leave some mystery for the reader. I want them to see what, where does Maldora's journey go? Where does it take him? Yeah. Are you are you prepared to follow evil are to its conclusion? To <laughs> is, your soul, is your soul resolute enough or will it, as he says in the beginning, dissolve like sugar and water, you know? Oh, wow. That's crazy. Okay, let's go to the next passage here. Last yeah. passage. Go, go to the, it's the next one, actually. Oh, this is the, I think this is the that's last that's one I had. Slides, yeah. So here we go. Okay. This is um, so. This is the third canto now, and uh, we 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 have a. We're still in the third canto, and this is and this is a vision that another character has of Maldora. And this is a man named Tremdel. We know we learn nothing about him except that he's wandering through this valley, and it says here. Uh, he, he sees someone in the distance who he identifies as Maldora. And he says, what is it approaching and going to meet Maldora? How huge the dragon is, bigger than an oak. You could say that its whitish wings joined firmly to its body have nerves of steel for they part the air with ease. Its body starts at the tiger's head and ends in a snake's long tail. I am not accustomed to seeing such things. What is that on its brow? I see written there a symbolic language, a word that I cannot decipher. With the final wing beat, it moves close to him whose tone of voice I know so well. It says, I have been waiting for you as you have waited for me. The hour has come. Here I am. Read on my brow my name written in hieroglyphic signs. But no sooner had Maldorer seen the enemy coming than he changed into a great eagle and prepared for combat, contentedly clacking his curved beak by which he means to solely undertake the, to devour the dragon's hind quarters. Here they are, drawing circles of decreased concentricity, sounding out their reciprocal strengths before combat. They are wise to do so. The dragon seems stronger. I wish it would gain victory over the eagle. I love this so much, and I'm so glad you included this because this is the perpetual fight that we, we this is the flipping of the poles. This is one of those central Hellenistic images. This is the goddess against, right? Against the, 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 this is that 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 fight that we constantly see between the masculine and the feminine, the dragon, you know, who is 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 representative of of Medea, right? And then the, the, then the eagle is representative of Zeus, you know? And they're in this constant warfare, trying to rile, trying to vie for, for control. And I love how he calls, I wish the dragon would take control. And I love how he calls Maldoror the fucking, the evil guy is the eagle, right? The eagle yeah. is a vulture. Like, <laughs> amazing. And so the I won't go into the full passage, but there's a battle that that under the that happens between Maldorer and uh, the dragon, and the dragon rips the eagle's skin. The eagle claims one of the dragon's eyes, and then the dragon breaks the one of the eagle's wings, and the eagle lands on the ground. And then this last passage, I believe it's the last slide. Um, if you want to go to it, okay, sorry. Yeah, no worries. The next one. Oh, that's the that's the last one I have here. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll go to slide thirteen. If you have it, I don't Maybe think I have it. it. Sorry, oh, I send it to you. Sorry. So, uh -huh. 
I'll just read, read the passage. Read it. I'll read the passage. It's not too yeah. long. The eagle is terrible and makes an enormous leap that shakes the earth as if he were about to take flight. Yet he knows that this is impossible. The dragon does not trust these movements. It thinks at any moment the eagle will attack on the side that has lost an eye. Wretch that I am, this is what happens. How did the dragon let itself get caught by the breast? It vainly tries to use cunning and force. I see that the eagle, despite the fresh wounds he has received at the base of his neck, is clinging with all of his limbs like a leech to the dragon, and is plunging his, deep, his beak deeper and deeper into the dragon's stomach. We can only see his body. He appears perfectly at ease and is in no hurry to come out. No doubt he is searching for something, while the dragon with its tiger's head utters roars that awaken the forests. Here is the eagle emerging from that cave. Eagle, how horrible you are. You are redder than a pool of blood. Although you hold a beating heart in your nervous beak, you are so covered with wounds that you can hardly support yourself on your feathered feet. And you stagger without loosening the grip of your beak beside the dragon which is dying in terrible agony. Victory was difficult to achieve. No matter you have earned it, Mon one must at least tell the truth. You are acting according to the rules of reason by divesting yourself of the form of the eagle during which you move away from the dragon's body. So, Maldorer, you are the victor. So, Maldorer, you have defeated hope. From now on, despair will nourish itself on your purest substance. From now on, you will return with deliberate steps to your career of evil. In spite of becoming, so to speak, blasé with regards to suffering, the last blow that you struck the dragon has not failed to affect me. Judge for yourself if I am suffering, but you frighten me. See the man fleeing in the distance. Malediction has grown its dense foliage on him, excellent soil. He is accursed and he curses. Where are your sandals taking you? Where are you going, moving like a sleepwalker on a roof? May your perverse destiny be fulfilled. Maldorer, goodbye until eternity when we will not be together. So Maldorer defeats the dragon. He rips his heart out and it dies. And then he just transforms back to a human. He suffered many blows, but he lives. And he continues on his way, perpetuating his cruelty against man and God. Oh, man. That's what a depressing ending. It's not even <laughs> ending the book. <laughs> oh, God. This is just one sequence. The next sequence describes like God is found laying on the ground, the creator. He's drunk and he's fallen and hit his head and he's bleeding. And all these animals come up to reproach him and scratch at his flesh and shit on him and piss on him. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> that's so, oh, wow. What a, what a crazy, and, and oh, that's so sad to see the dragon lose. I know. You know? What do you think is this, uh, the imagery of the dragon having a tiger's head? I was wondering that. I was wondering what the purpose was of including that well, detail. The mother goddess is usually depicted with a tiger, specifically in India, right? Durga, yeah. Yeah, the, the mother goddess in her, in, her, in her guise as the protective mother, the one who defends her children is Durga, who rides the, the tiger with the with the many, many, many. Also, sometimes she rides lions. Rhea, the, the Greek version, is always seen with lions. So these yeah. big cats, these powerful cats, are always associated with that goddess imagery, that powerful... Yeah, I, wasn't, I suspected there was a connection there, but I didn't really know anything about it, so... <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, uh, there's also a lot of Asian stuff imagery, I think, there with the tiger and the dragon, too, right? There's, there's an East versus, we're seeing a male versus female, an East versus West, a light versus dark. He's playing on all of these dualities. It also makes me think of a lot of these ideas we see in Zoroastrianism and this eternal war that's that's happening between these these primordial figures, the, the force of truth and the force of destruction, you know? Um, I also think in, in a lot of the um, the occultism that we see that's related to Hellenism, much more of the later stuff, you get all of this in like Hermeticism, you get a lot of these ideas about how, you know, Z Zeus or the current god who wields the scepter destroyed the feminine aspect and brought them low, 
did, you know, destroyed the previous person. There was a, you know, there was a transition of power. There was a fight and there, were, and, the, and there needs to be a, a, a throwing off of this person from their throne, but there's an un, there's an inability to do that, and this is a this there's a lot of anxiety about this because if you do not, you know, in the myths of the cycles, if you don't get the tyrant off his throne, he consumes the world, you know, and that's what Malad Malador won. He beat the dragon. So what is left but to consume the world? That's fucking dark, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, it's it's again as as uh, Andre Breton said, is the expression of a revelation so complete it seems to exceed human potential? You know, it's just it is so every single line just has so much imagery and magic in it that you're just like, where do I begin? <laughs> I understand why a lot of people compare him to Byron because he's playing with these ideas of evil, and he's like, oh. The Christians in our society is telling us what evil is. I'll show you. You want to see real evil? I'll show you real evil. And your real evil is the God that you love. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> and just like Byron in, in Cain, he does the same thing. Except Luc he says that Lucifer's like, oh, you, you're calling me the tyrant? Dude, I never told you to do shit. <laughs> I yeah. never lied to you once. I have documentable proof that guy's lied to you since the day you were born. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> Wild. I absolutely love it. Thank you for that. That was such a such an amazing deep dive into uh, into that work. So, what do you want to leave us with? When in in what are your final thoughts about uh, Sean the Malador? The Sean the Malador. After coming out of all this darkness, I think it's important to reaffirm the point of the work, which is that we have to face and experience this darkness and cruelty if we want to surpass it or learn to evolve beyond it. Right. And, and he his his other work, which I, I don't have, unfortunately, but it's coming in the mail, is uh, Le Poésie 1 and 2. And that was, he wrote that as a specific spiritual counterpoint to Maldor. So the two together are a duality of the, the goodness and hope of the poesy and the darkness and cruelty and despair of the Maldor. Oh, wow. Well, if you find it profound enough, maybe we'll have to come back and do a part two. Yeah, maybe. It's, uh, I, I'll, I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> oh, that sounds wild. Yeah, no, this, is, this was a really good... Thank you for showing me this person because this was someone who was kind of on my radar, but also obscured, like a lot of these figures are, you know? <laughs> right? You hear, oh, they're so great, but then you can never find their works. Lost <laughs> to the impulse of history, you know, and not, right? not brought into different translations and stuff. Fortunately, there are many translations of this work um, because it's such an important piece. Um, I'd like to uh, wrap up just with one last little quote from it. He says, he who believes that he is living on this earth is cradled by an illusion that it would be best to quickly evaporate. I, I fucking love that. That sums <laughs> up everything about this affirmation of life. Dude, you don't want to die. You know, what are you telling yourself? Life, you know, like, oh man, <laughs> face the cruelty. You know, and this is the thing. It's like, there is something to be gained. You know, this is a really hard exercise. And it's only do this if you're in the right place and at the right time in your life. But everyone needs to take those moments to sit in true darkness and to contemplate their own morality, their own mortality, but also to contemplate what evil is and what what if what are the actual horrific things that could happen to you if you don't actually engage with this kind of thought? and think about it you will be blindsided you will not be prepared you know so much of life is about and so much of the magical process is about shielding ourselves to the uncommon trauma processing the uncommon trauma life is absurd life is uh, it's it's confusing and our knowledge base is unsatisfactory so we need art in order to handle any of it <laughs> you know Yes, art is like the ultimate vehicle for understanding and processing a lot of 
these darker aspects of humanity and of just of life. Right. I often think about, there was a, an anecdote I remember reading. I'm not a huge Stephen King fan, but this is a great anecdote. He talks about how he's a young man, you know, in his early teens and he's having these really intense, horrific dreams, you know, and, and, the, and he goes and he tells his parents and his parents tell him that he should write it into a story. So he writes it into a story and then his parents read it and they're so shocked by it. They don't know what to do. So they take him to go see his doctor. <laughs> yeah, like his, his family doctor. And he goes to his medical doctor. And the story is about, and you can find the short story. It's, 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 it's actually a creepy one by, by King, where it's about this, I can't remember what it's called, but it's about this guy who gets stranded on a desert island and then proceeds to consume himself in order to survive. Wow. What, what ends up happening, though, when Stephen King goes to meet the doctor the doctor doesn't discourage him. The doctor starts engaging with him. The doctor starts answering questions and goes, wait a sec, how long would it take someone to survive if they were eating themselves? And he encouraged King, called up his parents and said, yeah, there's nothing wrong here. You should get the kid to keep writing. And look what we've all gained from this. One of the, one of the most popular uh, writers of all time. This yeah. You have to face your fears, engage with them, write about them, learn about what this is. Like you don't if we immediately cower and we put it into the dark, that's when things fester and can become truly evil. You know, if it stays on the page, it's a good story, you know? <laughs> if it stays in your head, maybe it comes out in an undo, untoward, yeah. disgusting ways, right? Yeah. Anyway, I love that. I love that so much. Um, so any last words? Any last words? Um, listeners should read the songs of Maldor. Yeah. <laughs> it's very it's get, you know, for fun, try to get a copy with the, uh, the Dali illustrations because they're just mind blowing. Or or support an amazing publisher in Infinity Land Press, someone that we wholeheartedly yes. love. Yes, they, right? they always, every small publishing house needs the help, any, any help they can get. So, All right, everyone. So like and subscribe. Uh, we will be back next week where I'm going to be doing the deep dive this time to Graham, and I'm going to be showing him one of my all-time favorite poets, H.D. Hilda Doolittle. This is going to be so much fun. Hilda Doolittle is a classicist, a poet, a translator, famous for being one of the defining figures of modernism, a, 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 a queer icon who, who helped save hundreds of people from the Holocaust. And, you know, just like one of the most amazing women I've ever had the pleasure of reading about. And I can't wait to share her story with you all. I'm so excited. So, Graham, do you have anyone in mind for, for your next episode? Are you still doing the research? Um, I think I'm still doing a bit of research. Um, there is someone I really want to do a deep dive on. He's a contemporary artist. His name is Gast Bouchet or Bouchet or Boucher. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. I have to look that up or ask him. I have him on Instagram. Um, <laughs> Love it. Because everything that he does is just steeped in Saturnian magic and Negrito alchemy. I love and that. It is fascinating. It's so interesting too, because this was you. We, you've shown me a couple interviews with him and some of his music and some of his art, and it's just it's all so evocative. But the thing that stood out to me is that he decided to cut himself off from the world and enter into sort of a neo-monastic lifestyle where he lives off the land and just yeah. creates art. He lives in a very remote area. Um, he is on social media, but like he's kind of removed himself from like contemporary art society, which he became a bit disillusioned with because of their lack of interest in magic. Well, you know, it's, it's one of these things where we still live in a world where you want to share your art, number one, and you have to share your art to live, number two. So we can't, you know, even those who try to disconnect have to dis have to stay connected to a certain degree if they want to have that artistic reach. But yeah, Gash Bouchette, that would be, or Boucher, however you pronounce that, 
would be a really great one to talk about. But thank you so much, everyone. Like and subscribe. Come back next week. Also, make sure you go to the link below and support Graham. You can buy his books of his original poetry. He publishes books by other people. And he has an amazing heavy metal band called The Ghosts of Shadow Moses. So thank you, everyone. Also, join us on Discord. Tomorrow, we're going to be doing Occult Explorers with Dion, where we're going to be talking about entheogenic husbandry. This is the breeding of human beings and animals for the production of drugs. Specifically, we're going to be looking into the horse cultures and the relationship between human horses and drug use. So it's going to get juicy. Thank you, everyone. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week. Good night, Graham. Thanks again. Hey. Hail Satan, everyone. Peace and love. <laughs>